everyone. I call this meeting to order. This is the Finance and Government Operations Committee of the City Council. All committee members are present today via Zoom. This is a remote or online meeting where all participants will be on a video or audio conference. Members of the public have the opportunity to address the committee if they have signed up for public comment per the rules published on the agenda and on our website Friday. We will call for the speakers when we get to the individual agenda item you signed up for. Here are the public comment ground rules. Comments are to be addressed to the committee members only. Each participant has two minutes to present. Any disruptive conduct will result in removal from the meeting. We will now move to, oh, we, to agenda K. And the reason why we're moving to K is because just in case we have any kind of um, questions, we have uh, Mr. Chris Sylvan available for us. And um, Sanchez, by request, it's uh, KR-102, approving and authorizing the acceptance and use of the Department of Justice Office for Victims of Crime. Um, Brian, discretionary community project fund, um, discretionary grant program awards providing an appropriation to the Albuquerque Community Safety Department beginning in fiscal year 2023. Move a due pass. I need a second. Second. Okay, second by Councillor Bassani. Councillors, any questions for staff or administration? Councillor Bassani. Mr. Chair, I just think for those people watching, it might be good to just give a brief overview of, of the benefits that this will have and what it's doing, please. Okay, Mr. Sylvan. Thank you, Councillor Sanchez. Um, this this grant is authorizing the um, acceptance and use of a uh, grant from the Department of Justice. It's the Victims of Crime Burn Discretionary Community Project Funding. Um, what happens is the city's going to receive a million dollars and it's going to be um, used through the Albuquerque Community Safety Department to fully implement the trauma, Albuquerque Trauma Recovery Center. And what the Albuquerque Trauma Recovery Center will do is it's going to create eight positions to a multilingual staff to serve both youth and adult survivors of physical assault, sexual assault, community violence, such as gun violence, domestic violence, and individuals who have lost a loved one to a homicide. TRC clients will have access to wraparound care that includes individual group therapy, group psychotherapy, case management, assistance with needs such as shelter, housing, financial benefits, food and clothing, legal adv advocacy, and linkage to medical care. They will also receive trauma-informed psychiatry. The only question that I would have, Mr. Sylvan, is um, what happens when uh, the funding runs out since it's a grant? So the funding would, if you know, the council approves this, it's it's the granting period is from October 30th, 2022 to April 30th, 2024. And since these are grant funded positions, I believe that the funding would, sorry, the positions would come out of the general fund at that point in 2024, unless the city applies for another round of this grant. And more than likely, would we be applying for another round of this grant? Councillor Sanchez, I'd have to refer that to the administration. Good evening, councillors and chair. I, I wanted to, this is Mariela with the community department. So the trauma recovery center falls under our um, violence intervention program. And I have, uh, Deputy uh, Dama Madrigal here who can go into some of this, but the Trauma Recovery Center is something that cities across the nation are, are putting together. So this was really to help build this up and see how it tests out first, right? It's meant to be a pilot, um, ultimately, so that we can see if we want to continue something like this. This is something that nobody across um, the state or the city is offering at this point. Um, and so this is something that would be a but there are cities across the nation who are doing this really, really well. 
Um, and our violence intervention program, as well as our school-based violence intervention program, which is also something that we're piloting, um, ultimately would feed into this. So there's already a pipeline that goes into this kind of work. So we anticipate, and all these different types of positions, the clinicians, the case managers, the peer support workers, all fall, fall under the kind of scope that ACS does. So we anticipate that once we have a, a couple years um, and they were already being asked to look at additional funding for this um, through the federal government because it is something that um, is under their wants. We're seeing a lot of funding going to violence prevention. We think that this is something that we might then bring to you guys in small pieces to then ask for general funding down the road. But we're still looking at like potentially two years out. Okay, thank you for answering that question. And, you know, one of the things that we're uh, here on city council are pretty unified on is just to make sure that we have the data and the numbers to show um, that the, that's either working or it isn't. And and uh, it sounds like a very, very good program. Um, any other questions or comments? Okay, counselors, if there's no other questions or comments, I need a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. And that passes on a 5 0 vote. Okay, we're going to get back on schedule here. And we're looking at item A um, Sanchez EC 20 EC 229 um, report of FY22 outstanding encumbrances reappropriate it in physical year 2023. Um, move receipt be noted, need a second. Second. Um, Councilor Davis, second. Councilors, any questions for the staff or administration? Or administration? Seeing none, is there anyone signed up to speak? No. Okay, Councilors, if there's no questions and comments. We're ready for a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. And that passes by zero vote. We will now move on to agenda item B, uh, which is EC-230. Um, Sanchez EC-230 revenue and expense report for first quarter fiscal year 2023 and quarterly savings use report. Move, receipt be noted. Need a second. Second. Second by Councilor Bassan. Or Feeble Corner, I'm sorry. Um, Councilors, any questions for the staff or administration? There being none, anyone signed up to speak? No, Mr. Chen. They're okay. Councilors? There's no other questions or comments. We're ready for a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 5 0 vote. We will now move on to agenda item EC 234, Department of Arts and Cultural Progress Report. On R-20 through 22-53, move receipt be noted. Need a second. Councilor Feeblecorn, second. Councilors, any questions or for the staff or administration? There being none, councilors, if there's no questions or comments, I'm ready for a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Passes on a 5-0 vote. Now we're moving on to item D. Um, and this one is Councillor Bassan by request. Councillor Bassan. Mr. Chair, 055 is Committee Substitute 2, amending the City Inspector General Ordinance, Chapter 2, Article 17 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque. I move a deferral to the next FGO meeting on April 10th. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. Second is Councilor 
Davis. And counselors, if there's no other questions or comments, we're ready for a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fablecorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Passes on a 5-0 vote. We will now move on to agenda item E, which is O-56, Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, O-56, Committee Substitute 2, amending the Accountability and Government Ordinance, Chapter 2, Article 10 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque. I'd like to move a deferral to the next FGO meeting April on April 10th. For second, Councilor Davis for the deferral. Councilors, any questions or comments? Seeing none, we're ready for a vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelcorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. Passes on a 5 0 vote. We will now move on to agenda F O 65. Councilor Bassan. By request. Okay, we just moved on to agenda item F O 65. Councilor Bassan, by request. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just so you know, I'm getting, I'm having some problems with my Wi Fi here. Um, O65 is amending Chapter 5, Article 5 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque, the Public Purchases Ordinance relating to Council approval requirements and procurement thresholds of the code. I move a withdrawal. Thank you. And it looks like I have a second from Councillor Davis, Councillor Fiebelcorn. Um, so moving withdrawal, ready for a vote. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Fiebelcorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Passes on a 5 0 vote. We will now move on to agenda item G. O-69, Councilor Fiebelcorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is O-69, amending the short-term rental ordinance section 13-19-1 through 13-19-8 of the Albuquerque City Code in order to require all short-term rental units to have a local property manager available to respond to maintenance and security current concerns, limit short-term rental permits to three per natural person, limit the number of short-term rental permits issued citywide to no more than 1,200 and increasing the civil penalties for non-compliance. Move a due pass. Uh, do I have a second? Um, Councilor Davis. Councilors, any questions for the staff for administration? Ms. Mr. Chair, I do have um, quite a few amendments, and I don't know if you want to pass those oh, before yes. or after public comment. Um, let's see. We can go through the amendments and then do the the, the comment. Does that sound okay. right? Or should we go the other way around? They, the amendments might be something that okay. folks want to hear about before they speak, so um, okay. that's okay with you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we're going to hold right there and let's move into um, amendment number one in your iPads. And I, Mr. Chair, I'm going to move the one that's labeled A. Um, I hope that's what everybody has. And that is going to be committee amendment number one. And that is to revise the text below as follows. The director of planning and their designees shall at all times limit the number of STR permits to 1,800. This limit is applicable citywide. The purpose of this is that we had a limit of 1,200. Um, and from hearing from various folks within the community, we did want to raise that limit to 1,800, which would be about three times as many as we have currently um, operating in the city. So with that, I'll move that amendment for, for this committee. Okay. Now we need a second. 
And it looks like Councillor Davis. So amendment number one, I will be voting on amendment one, number one, and we're ready for a vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fiebelcorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Passes on a 5 0 vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And then I think we can bring up um, the next amendment. Thank you. This will be committee amendment number two. Um, and on, can we scroll up a little bit? Thank you. Um, I won't go through these details. This is, um, you know, I'd like to let um, Ms. Morris explain this one, <laughs> if we, if it's okay with you, Mr. Chair. Yes, Ms. Morris. Yes, this amendment um, clarifies that while the bill proposes to limit the permits being issued to natural persons, it clarifies that the property can be owned by an ownership entity other than a natural person. So uh, you could have a property owned by an um, a trust or an LLC or some other corporate form, but the permit would be issued to a natural person. So for example, uh, I'm Petra Morris, I would have, I'd own property as P Morris LLC, but I would apply for a permit as Petra Morris. Um, this amendment also clarifies that the, the limit is of three per, per natural person, um, would also apply to three per um, ownership entity. So that people couldn't use ownership entities as a way to get around the three per natural person limitation. Um, and then it just makes some um, reorganization of the, of the document, uh, of the bill, so that all of the language about the permit um, limitations are all in one, sub, one subsection of the bill. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Mr. Chair, um, with that, I'll move it to pass on this amendment. Thank you. Councilors, any other questions or comments? Need, oh, need a second, I'm sorry. Councilor Davis for the second. And, and a Council question, Mr. Council Chair. Comment. Go ahead, Councilor Davis. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, I just wanna ask Ms. Morris or the sponsor, I, I, thank you, I think this is a, a big help in, because I think more and more of these are owned by LLCs because of the, the legal issues here. Um, but I, I'm curious how this applies down the road. And, you know, I, I may be overthinking this a little bit. You know, some of these LLCs will have five or six members because it's it's multiple people chipping in. Some of them, you know, have a small one or two percent stake. Um, while they may own, say, a majority of, of one house or one property, they might own a one percent or something just because they gave in-kind construction services or legal services or something. I, I just wonder how we're defining ownership in that case, if it's not a natural person or if that's something we need to explore a little better. Um, I, I feel like we could be excluding folks accidentally just by including this piece here. Is that a Ms. Morris question? Um, um Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Davis, um, so in the bill, uh, it, there are a couple sections that have been, uh, sorry, in the amendment, there are a couple sections that have been added. One talks about a trust, an LLC, or other ownership entity. So if you have something, some other way of owning the property, um, that's one section of it. But there's also some language that requires um, that information be provided about who the owner is. And so if you did have a situation where you had a property with multiple owners, um, you would have to decide who who is applying for the permit in their name. And that could be the short-term rental operator, not, not the actual, one of the actual owners um, that is applying for the permit as the natural person for, for the permit's purpose. Um, but there's a section in the amendments that requires that the if the ownership entity is something other than the owner, that the um, information be provided. So... The city would have in that instance the name for the operator, the name for the manager, and then the name for, for the property owners. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair and Ms. Morris, thank you. So in, in a situation where let's say five people own a house, own a property together, 
they could designate one as the managing member for the LLC who would be in charge, or they could designate a third party that's not connected to the business as the permit holder. As the short-term rental operator, yes. And so they would apply for the permit in the operator's name. So Ms. Morris, not to be a overpick this, but I mean, in theory, I could set up a business to just apply for permits. Like if I own 10 houses, I could just ask my friends to get the permit and still get her. I'm just not sure. I, I want to support the the uh, the spot. Let me be clear. I want to support the sponsor and I want her to have the bill she she wants. And um, and I know she's worked hard to get the compromises we need. Um, I just have some more questions about this, and I, I apply just what I, what little bit I know about sort of business life here. Um, we ran into these problems when we wrote the cannabis law, defining who is an owner and who has ownership control, who has responsibility. Um, you know, there apparently there are some IRS provisions and state provisions about 10% ownership has a different legal responsibility than less than. Um, I just I'm, then I'm worried about a permit holder not having responsibility. So I, I would like to support the amendment this evening, but then maybe visit this before full council if it moves tonight, um, because I think this is going to be an incredibly important piece um, and could open up a big loophole. And there may be a solution in here that I haven't seen yet, but I, I would just like to work on this a little better, but not to prolong the meeting. I'll be supporting it. I think there might be somebody in legal who, uh, sorry, in the mayor's conference room who might be able to answer a bit better than I just did. So if you would like, if you, if, the, if it's the um, committee's discretion to defer to them, that's an option too. Yes, uh, mayor's conference room, can you chime in, please? Sure. Go ahead. They have Hi, lots of lawyers evening. up there. Somebody knows. <laughs> Hi, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair. And uh, members of council. This is Maureen Kempton. I'm the um, consumer protection manager. And um, I did work a little bit on this amendment um, with Ms. Morris. And it was quite difficult, uh, as you point out, Councillor Davis, to try to think of all the potential ways that somebody could try to subvert this limit and um, cut them off. And ultimately, we decided there probably isn't a way to do that. But we did add some uh, a clause for preventing subterfuge. And I guess in the amendment, it's designated item five, page six, line three. Um, so this says subterfuge prohibited. No person shall fully take any action for the purpose of evading the application of this article. And what this is attempting to get at is if there were some kind of scenario where somebody had set up like a straw man operation or was naming their kid as the permit holder or something like that, that that would give uh, city legal at least some um, opportunity to argue that they were doing something that was just a pretense in order to evade the application of the ordinance. But as far as people being able to set up new LLCs or get a power of attorney or a property manager, a contract that was legal um, to have them hold a permit, there wasn't really a good way that we could figure out to prevent all of that from happening. But the way that the amendment would work is that it does make it a lot more difficult than it is under the current version. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate that, Maureen and, uh, and Ms. Morris and Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I think these are real. These are bigger issues, and, and we haven't figured that out at the state level either. Um, I'd like to revisit it. I think that's why I, I understand the purpose of this. I really do. <laughs> I definitely want to prohibit all of our short-term <laughs> properties from becoming holdings of some out big out-of-state, you know shell corporation kind of thing with a bunch of little individual LLCs. Um, I'm not sure this is the right answer. I don't know what it is, um, but I let, I want to support this this evening so we can keep the conversation going. But I, I want us to take a new look at this. I don't I think this is kind of a um, I think this gives us false confidence. If that's the intent is to, to limit that cap, there are just 100,000 ways around it. And I just don't think this is going to get at it. So let's revisit it if that's OK with the sponsor. But I, we have a long agenda and I certainly want to continue this conversation. Thank you to everybody involved. Thank you, Councillor Davis. Thank you, Mayor's Conference Room. Councillor Bassan. Mr. Chair, um, uh, would the sponsor be open to changing on the page four number 1200 to 1800, given our past amendment just passed? the committee uh mr chair um yes that so that was because they were separate um amendments mm -hmm. we did think that the first one that passed would take precedence so it would definitely be 1800 if we want to change it here too just to be doubly sure that would be just fine with me thank you and 
I guess I'll just start by saying just real quick so that it makes sense from the get go that I given what Councillor Davis just said and where I was thinking earlier before this meeting too, I just because of the all the general nuances that could and could not happen and all of the details that we may or may not think about in micromanaging this part. I do understand that the intention is there uh, in a in a positive way, but I, I'm not going to support this amendment and I will not be supporting the bill. Thank you, Councilor Sun. Any other questions or comments? Okay, I'd like to chime in too, and uh, I feel pretty much the same way. Um, I'm not um, a fan of it either. Um, I don't know if there's even a way that we can fix this to to fit my personal um, ideas, but uh, I won't be supporting this amendment as. Uh, as well. And with that, anybody else? Any other? I don't see anyone else commenting. So, um, Mr. Chair, uh, I'm sorry, I can't find my, I'm using, utilizing my phone because my internet's down here at the house. Oh, I'm sorry. But anyway, um, sorry, no. my internet's down here at the house, but I just wanted to say maybe uh, Councillor um, Feeblecorn can hold off on the amendment until we um, uh, take it to full council. Uh, you know what, Councilor Penny, I think that's a great idea, Mr. Chair. If that's okay with you, I will um, just withdraw this tonight and we can have some further meetings about it um, and bring it to full council when we get there. Okay, so we would need a second on withdrawal. I'm okay with that. No, no, we, we just draw, we have to draw it. Okay. That's my understanding, yes. Okay, so we're withdrawing this amendment, uh, which is amendment B number two. Okay. Okay, now Council of People Corn, amendment three. Which will now be um, committee <laughs> amendment number two, right? Um, and so, Mr. Chair, this is, a, in my mind, a very important amendment to this bill. Um, one of the concerns that we've had from multiple people is that there are folks out there that are already operating more than three um, Airbnbs or, or short-term rentals, and they would like to have kind of a legacy situation set up so that they can continue to do so. And that's what this amendment does. I won't read it all out, but it's there on the screen for you. And basically it says, if you have three or more permits that are active on the effective date of this ordinance um, and you continue to maintain those permits and you, you, know, you don't lapse on those permits, then you can continue with whatever number you have now. And there are, uh, it's my understanding, 14 people in Albuquerque that have more than three right now. And we certainly don't want to take away, um, you know, business that someone's been been having um, up to now. Um, so with that, I'll move this floor amendment or this committee amendment number two. Second, Councillor Davis. Councillors, any other questions or comments? I'm seeing none. Um, we're ready for a vote. Councillor Bassant. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fablecorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 5 0 vote. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple more. Okay. We are now on Amendment 4. Um, Councillor Fablecorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this would be um, Committee Amendment Number 3. Um, and basically, we are adding a sentence on to this section that says that the cap on the number of short-term rental permits issued does not apply to short-term rental permits for single rooms within an occupied dwelling unit. The point of this is that there are folks that are renting rooms within their homes um, on, on these types of sites. And we certainly um, do not see that as a, a, a problem for you know, the housing crisis. And so we wanna make sure that they are allowed to do that. So that amendment um, is, is just for those rooms that are being rented out within an occupied dwelling unit. And with that, I'll move that uh, amendment and, and ask for a second. Second, Councillor Davis. 
Councilors, any questions or comments? Councilor Basel. Mr. Chair, the same goes for this amendment as in the previous one. Can we please change it to 1800 instead of 1200? Mr. Chair, that was the intent um, with all of these amendments. So that, that is not a problem on my end. Okay, so 1800 to 1200, thank you. Other way around. I mean, I'm sorry, the other way around, <laughs> 1200 to 1800. So, uh, so, and I think we're ready for a vote. Councilor Basson. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fablecorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 5 0 vote. Okay. Councilors, any other questions or comment? Um, so we're voting on the final bill as amendment. amended. Mr. Mr. Chair, I did have one more amendment. Oh, shoot. I don't see it. Share it, share it. it was emailed out by Ms. Morris right before the meeting started. So my apologies for the lateness on that. Okay. No um, there it is. It looks like it's up. Right. And I will, if it's okay with Mr. Chair, I'll have Ms. Morris explain this one to us. Mr. Chair, councillors, um, this amendment uh, clarifies that civil enforcement penalties um, are available for enforcement of this um, bill. Um, this is some language that's come from the legal department, so um, I'll defer to the mayor's conference room to do a little bit more of a detailed explanation of the changes here. Thank you. Okay, so now we're going to go move back. Um, any anybody have any comments in reference to this bill, Council? Mr. Chair, I'll move the amendment. Um, do we have a second? Was that you, Council Basad, or did you have comment? Mr. Chair, I'll second it, but I, I do want to hear from the administration about the reasoning of this and some of the background on it, please. Okay, thank you. Mayor's conference room. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members. This is Diane Dolan, um, Government Affairs Manager for the Mayor. The This amendment creates an administrative process for civil penalties. The ordinance as it exists today has criminal penalties through reference to 1199 uh, in the uh, Code of Ordinances, which is our general penalties. Those are criminal penalties of up to 90 days in jail or $500. Uh, the existing ordinance also has a provision for civil penalties, uh, but requires taking the individual to court. So this amendment uh, creates an administrative process that's similar to the hearing officer and administrative process uh, and a lot of other ordinances um, and creates an opportunity for enforcement without requiring that the city take a person to court, either a criminal or civil court. So it is an administrative process for the civil penalties. Um, certainly uh, an individual could, could uh, still, still appeal those. Um, but it allows the city to enforce through a hearing officer and administrative process rather than through criminal penalties or filing a suit in court. Thank you. Councilor Bassan, anything else? No, Mr. Chair, I never received the amendment though. Yeah, we just saw it um, coming up on the screens. Um, Mr. Chair, I am so sorry about that. It, it did get emailed out, but um, if folks need a little more time to take a look at it, I am I am happy to um, withdraw or, or bring it to full council or whatever the will of the committee is. What I'm thinking is it might not be a bad idea to make sure that everybody has a good look at it. So if you're willing to withdraw and then bring it back either to the full council or to um, or or back to this committee um, for another look at it, we can do that. Certainly, Mr. Chair, I'm happy to withdraw and and again, apologize for the timing on that. And I will make sure that it gets to everyone and, and check in with folks on on, you know, if we're going in the right direction on that or not. 
Thank you, Councillor Feeblecorn. With that, Amendment 5 is withdrawn. Okay, so we're going to move back to the original bill, but I need to make sure that I don't forget anyone to speak. We have public comment, correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Thank you. So we're going to public comment. Our first speaker is Corey Marshall, followed by Lacey Pontes. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Good after, good evening, um, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Corey Marshall, and I serve as the Director of State and Local Government Relations, Central Region for the Chamber of Progress, a tech industry coalition committed to ensuring that all Americans benefit from technological leaps. Our corporate partners include companies like Airbnb, but our partners do not have a vote or a veto over our positions. We want to thank the committee for discussing these amendments today, which we know that you will present in front of the full body under section uh, for section 13-19-1 through section 13-19-8. Um, Short-term rentals offer benefits for both hosts and communities, such as increased access to affordable lodging options and supplemental income to support families throughout the city. With pandemic aid ending and inflation continuing to rise, many families are still struggling to recover from major financial losses over the years. According to a survey conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau, 40 million Americans, 40 million Americans have trouble affording household expenses, and over 25 million are forced are food insecure. Albuquerque residents who rent out a unit or room can generate additional income to stabilize the costs of increased goods and services. The hosts, these hosts locally are not traditional, traditionally property investors or conglomerates. They are primary residence dwellers who are in dire need for additional sources of income to make ends meet. In fact, a 2019 report found that Airbnb hosts in rural counties of New Mexico and the United States earned $36 million in particular. Short-term rentals offers affordable and convenient lodging options for large families and workers who are on temporary assignments. Guests who opt for short-term rentals are able to contribute to local economies, not only directly to hosts, but also by patronizing nearby shops and restaurants. The proposed ordinance in its current form overlooks the economic benefits of short-term rentals and instead punishes community members by restricting the number of listings throughout the city of New um, Albuquerque. Thank you. For, thank you. Mr. Cornelius. Lacey Pontes, followed by Carl Vidal. Thank you, counselors. Uh, I just wanted to address a few uh, things that have come up as a result of uh, these proposed changes. The first is that um, it seems that you want to put a limit or it's proposed to put a limit on the number of units that a individual can can have, uh, which is only which is only targeting those of those of us that are middle class investors. Um, I understand the push to not allow big outside corporations to come in and buy up all of our houses. But that's an issue that isn't happening here in Albuquerque. Uh, there, there are none. There are no large outside investors. And you can find that out just by taking a look at Airbnb, where you'll see um, from all the people that, are, that you're hearing from tonight. Um, second is there's so many unintended consequences. I know that it's been said that um, houses that house travel, um, that have, sorry. Um, housing for film crews and travel nurses isn't going to be impacted by this legislation. Uh, but I personally can tell you that that's just not true, uh, particularly with the way that um, film is sort of unpredictable and seasonal. The only way that uh, people can keep those houses available for film is by also renting short term when there aren't any film tenants there. And the same goes with travel nurses. Um, and a question that I have is, um, why, why are we okay with a house being taken off of the market for, um, to house somebody from film, but we're not okay with it being taken off for short-term rentals? The difference between 29 days and 30 days just doesn't make sense when it's still houses being taken off the market. There are so many benefits of short-term rentals that are are going to be lost if you put this, um, if you pass this, and we just feel like we need to be taken into consideration and have our voices heard as well. Thank you. 
Carl Vidal, followed by Coy Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Councillors. I uh, Zoom before the committee this evening to urge the uh, opposition of 069. This is now my third visit in front of the uh, City Council, and I hope I'm becoming a familiar face to you as a leader of the short-term rental community and a highly ethical and pragmatic and caring Albuquerque citizen. Uh, we have now submitted to the city and the mayor's office the facts about short-term rentals. In 2022, we hosted 431,000 guests. We've shown that over 2,000 hosts representing over 2,000 rentals will be affected by this legislation. And we've shown a $216 million economic impact for the city. We have shown our rentals create over 2,280 jobs, and that doesn't include the number of hosts that make a living off of these rentals. As the leader of the short-term rental community, I have taken hundreds of phone calls at this point. I have taken emails, survey responses from many, many of our 2,000 hosts locally. The Albuquerque hosts have proven to be innovative, resourceful, dedicated, professional, and may I say full of grit. I ask the city council to support our innovation, support our dedication, support our professionalism. I ask you to support our industry to remain competitive. I ask you to allow our community to participate in our economy with the supply and demand of our marketplace. And I ask you to support and allow Albuquerque citizens to remain innovative. If you allow us to remain innovative, you will permit us to, in, uh, to continue our economic impact in our community here in Albuquerque. With your support, a large portion, or sorry, without your support, a large portion of those 430,000 guests are going to book in other cities. Please vote do not pass on this legislation. We need your help. Thank you, Mr. Reda. Corey Lee, followed by Mark Boitano. Thank you, Councillor. Now that we've had time to look over this proposal, we find the number of short-sighted stipulations in this ordinance really staggering. So, th and thank you, Councillor Davis, for bringing up the contradiction of this bill with the U.S. law in terms of natural persons. The city putting in a clause to allow the city to violate natural person rights granted by the U.S. law in order to give itself power to enforce this ordinance tells us exactly how flawed this bill is. Not only will this ban be detrimental to so many families who are renting out their personal homes, who are only trying to fight inflation, afford their bills, it will have almost zero positive effect to any housing crisis. These are families who are just trying to survive here. And if only 14 people have over three permits, why is it so important to have this clause in the bill? We have not seen any evidence provided that the mayor's office that would alleviate any sort of housing shortage. And so the numbers really don't add up. And what adds up is the tax revenues, which are just under $14 million that the mayor is willing to throw away for near zero gain. Our community um, uh, is coming together, renovating houses, taking rare opportunities to better our lives, creating jobs, um, just trying to stay afloat here. And there are far reaching ramifications, such as the movie industry. According to the movie industry operation managers, producers, executives are more likely to book short term rentals over hotel rooms for their short term stays, which can range from a few days, a few weeks at a time. So forcing everybody to use hotels and propping the giant hotel industry against the small mom and pop hosts is kind of unprecedented here. Uh, according to a Marcus Millichamp economic report, the per diem for hotels in Albuquerque, $91, and there's 17,000 hotel rooms. And at a 66.5% occupancy rate, that's an income of $997,500 a day for the hotel industry. So find families hundreds of dollars a day, threatening them with 90 days of jail, will bankrupt families, remove them from their homes, exasperating that homeless issue. The average host uh, has $13,800 in 2021 in revenue. And I'm just asking the city council to reconsider this bill that violates property rights, destroys over a thousand small businesses. Mark Boitano, Mark Boitano, followed by Nate Boitano. Nate Boitano, followed by Carl Holm. Hello, counselors. Thank you for meeting tonight and hearing us out. 
Um, my name is Nate. I am a real estate broker um, in Albuquerque, and I uh, manage with a partner 10, um, 10 properties, mostly, uh, you know, travel nurses in the, the longer term. Um, but as uh, Lacey mentioned earlier, I mean, there are times when we have to put our mind on Airbnb if we have somebody move out, like I have an example right now, we had somebody move out at the beginning of uh, the end of last month. We have somebody moving in uh, in like three weeks from now. And so otherwise, we just have to leave it empty for a month. But instead, we can uh, rent it out and have people in between. Um, I just wanted to kind of mention from the real estate perspective, um, I'm 34 years old. I have a lot of clients who are my age, plus or minus a little bit. And we um, we don't expect to have Social Security <laughs> later. And so for us, these properties are our retirement. And so I have clients who are looking to buy a duplex or a fourplex or whatever, just to try and get some kind of um, income later on. And uh, the, um, the short-term rentals create income for these properties in a way that a typical rental doesn't. And so, I mean, if you're looking to buy a triplex right now between the property taxes raising and interest rates and whatever, if you buy a $300,000 triplex, uh, the mortgage payment versus the rents, the rents will barely, if anything, cover the mortgage payments. You're actually not making any money. So the best way to make money on that is to short term one of those units or two of those units. And I, you know, as prices continue to go up, I don't know if that's going to change. Um, so I just, I, a couple, couple questions uh, just to consider. Um, number one, can a license be revoked? Um, number two, will permits be uh, grandfathered in perpetuity? So if I have three permits right now, am I going to have to fight for that every year or do I just apply every year? Um, or is there something that can be able to take that away? So I'm um, grateful for you guys. Thank you. i um, trying to oppose this. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, even with the changes there has, there's a lot of strong concern about um, this uh, STR ordinance. I think a part of the problem is the speed with which the executive. Me, I'm sorry, who's speaking? Uh, this is Mark Boitano. I was the previous speaker. Um, I was on mute and they, they moved to uh, the next speaker. You can turn on your camera and thank you, Mark. Please proceed. Okay, so even with the changes, there's a lot of strong concern about the changes to the ordinance. I think a part of the problem is the speed with which the executive branch, the mayor's office, wishes to change the current law versus the deliberation the lawmaking branch, the city council, took to create the ordinance. As you know, the current ordinance was a result of a year-long study by a 12-person task force created by the city council that held nine meetings, including a public meeting that was attended by 90 people. The resulting 73-page report acknowledge the complexity of the issues around uh, short-term rentals and even had to extend the deadline for the preparation of the report because they wanted to summarize all those. Over a dozen issues around permitting, accounting, and regulation made it into the current ordinance, but nowhere was there any discussion of limiting the number of short-term rentals or limiting the number of owners uh, who can operate them. Page four of the report says, a short-term rental advisory committee should be established and should convene only when necessary to review or change the regulations. Rental owners have not seen evidence that this committee was established. Regardless of whether or not the cap is 1,200 or 1,800, if some property owners feel harmed by the regulatory taking of their property, this is a lawsuit waiting to happen. A taking under eminent domain is when a physical property is taken with compensation. A regulatory taking is when the regulation of a property prevents the use thereof, when that use is deemed detrimental to the public interest. Seniors operating uh, short-term rentals, detrimental, re really? There are a number of unresolved issues, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. I recommend the committee establish this advisory uh, task force. Uh, that can make recommend, recommendations to the full council and we can deal with a lot of these unresolved issues. Thank you very much. Carl Holm, followed by Shane Dolinsky. 
Good evening, uh, counselors. This is uh, I'm Carl Holm, the executive director for the Hotel Association called GALA, Greater Albuquerque Hotel Association. We support, we applaud, and we support your efforts to continue crafting legislation to manage short-term rentals. And uh, in this case, O2369, the Hotel uh, Association supports the current proposed amendments as they make sense and are reasonable. Right now, key markets across the country, if not the world, are re-amending some of the STR legislation to gain more control over this fast-growing segment and to provide protection for communities. We all want the same thing. Uh, we want growth. We want protections for neighborhoods. We want protections for uh, short-term rental guests, as well as we want a positive uh, impression of our destination. Um, Albuquerque is positioned well to well to capture more star business in the future. This is why it is important that your legislation be complete considering current parameters and the lessons learned from other cities. It is important for the health of tourism growth and local economy while protecting Albuquerque's unique neighborhood character. And this is why some may take issue with capping of the 1800 units, but there's issues there and New Orleans, Las Vegas, and several other cities have gone back now because of the issues with, with um, uh, an excessive amount of short-term rentals uh, and decimating some of the character of the neighborhoods. And I think we need to protect that. Also, it, it protects uh, housing prices uh, and, and, and protects the affordable housing stock uh, in general. So um, we view the STAR STR regulations as important and a key ingredient to Albuquerque's future growth. In fact, these are really basic, solid, and necessary standard operating regulations that many uh, cities undertake. I do agree that we probably could uh, work together to make this a win-win for everyone. I think that's really important for everybody. That uh, So we're not against uh, more discussion. I think there just up. needs to be um, a better discussion as to what the end result is. Thank you. Shane Dolinsky. You are muted, sir. Sorry about that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman and counselors. Uh, my name is Shane Delinsky. I am uh, the Airbnb community leader for the um, Facebook uh, community. Um, right now we have over 500 members um, and we absolutely oppose this for several reasons. But I, I think the spirit of this bill, and correct me if I'm wrong, Councillor Feibelkorn, is to ensure and enhance the amount of affordable housing that you know, we are trying to give to our community, which we all see as a problem. In fact, I'm on a committee on the board of realtors. I'm a realtor who is trying to help attack this problem because it is definitely a problem. But I think we're taking a very myopic approach with this bill. Um, if we cap it at 1,800, there's over 250,000 units available in Albuquerque. You're capping the opportunity for small business people to run, manage, maintain, and build generational wealth for their families, which is the American dream. And I'm not sure why we would want to do that in such a small way. If we wanted to cap the amount and the opportunity of hardworking individuals to expand what they're trying to do as investors and as ambassadors to the world, because as Airbnb and short-term rental hosts, we are ambassadors to the world. The majority of us take so much pride. We have booklets of things to do in Albuquerque, from the peak to the balloon fiesta, from running up and down the Rio Grande to Santa Fe. Um, we're ambassadors for our city, but less than 1%, less than 0.008% would be the cap if this was to pass. 0.008% is what you would allow us small business owners to take to the world to show off the beauty, the splendor, the enchantment of our city. And by passing this bill, you're not only reducing that ability, but you're also taking the opportunity away from all of us who are trying to be ambassadors and investors for ourselves. Thank you for your time, everybody. Thank you. That concludes our public comment. And counselors, any other questions or comments um, on this bill? 
If not, Councillor Feeble Clerk to close. Oh, Mr. Chair, I think I see Councillor Davis have a oh, question. And then I would be interested if after Councillor Davis, if we could um go to the mayor's conference room and see if Ms. Dolan has anything she'd like to add. Thank you, Councillor Feeble Clerk. Councillor Davis. Uh, maybe we'll let the mayor's office do it. They might answer my question, I suspect, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mayor's Conference Room. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Um, first of all, we'd like to, to thank the sponsors for, for working on this bill and with the um, STR industry feedback that we've received. And we look forward to continuing to work with her to address the concerns that we can, that we've uh, heard tonight. I would like to respond just to a couple of things um, specific to the economic impact uh, and point out that this bill is not proposing to reduce the number of existing STRs. And in fact, with the amendment tonight that Councillor Feeblecorn sponsored, and, and we are supportive of that, um, it, it builds a cushion. It is triple the amount of the current registered permitted short-term rental units in the city. Um, and it is about 400 more if you want to consider those who have not been following all our laws and have not, uh, have not permitted their properties yet. So we don't anticipate seeing any negative economic impact as we are not reducing uh, the numbers in the industry at this time. Um, we've, this is also sort of a proactive bill, you know, as it's been described, the intent is to protect the loss, further loss of housing stock to the short-term rental industry. So it's really more of a prophylactic. We have not yet had large companies coming into Albuquerque buying at large amounts of housing stock, but we are seeing it occur across the country. And so part of the intent of this is to prevent that from happening here. Um, in September of last year, we had around 1,000 units. That includes both permitted and unpermitted short-term rental units in the city of Albuquerque. This is just within the city proper, not the greater metro area. Um, we based our original cap in the bill on that 1200 number because it has been fairly consistent over the last couple of years, going back to the task force that one of the speakers referenced in 2019. As of March of this year, six months later, uh, that number is now up to 1400. So there has been in six months a 40% increase and the numbers of short-term rentals in the city of Albuquerque, which is concerning. Um, so again, this is intended more as a preventative measure to prevent further loss of housing stock to the short-term rental industry, and also with the intent of minimizing any negative impacts on those who are already participating in this business. That's why we've set the uh, targets for the limits where we have. Um, we also support the, the amendment that passed tonight that will allow those who currently have more than three more, uh, permits to continue to hold those permits. And yes, uh, in perpetuity, in answer to one of the speaker's questions, so long as those permits are kept active. So, as, so long as they are renewed um, each year before they expire. Thank you, Ms. Dolan. And Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and thank you to Ms. Dolan. I think uh, we've had a chance to talk about this at some length with the administration. Um, I have to say, I, I want this move, this bill to move out of committee tonight um, to the full council so we can consider it. I think we've got most of those amendments carried. Um, but I, I, for one, am still a little bit skeptical. I am not bought in yet that this uh, ordinance would help us long-term address our housing shock shortage uh, housing stock shortage in a significant way, if at all. Um, and if it doesn't do that, I, I, I kind of don't know that I, it feels like a solution looking for a problem. And I know this is a priority of the administration. So I want to give them the chance to make that case. Uh, and I appreciate Ms. Dolan working on this with the sponsor and others. Um, I'm not yet convinced, but I want to see this come out of committee tonight so we can have that conversation uh, more largely. And, and hopefully there's some better information um, and data that we can see on how this might help our bigger housing sh uh, uh, shortage, which I think is a much more pressing issue than uh, than adding this piece of short-term rental regulation at this time. But I'm willing to see. So uh, I hope and encourage my uh, my uh, 
other counselors to vote this out tonight so we can consider it in a few weeks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Davis. Anyone else have any comments? Anyone else? Nope. Mr. Chair, do you want me to close yes, up here? Um, or? Councilor Feeble Corn to close. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and thank you everybody for the conversation tonight. Um, you know, I, let me just say, I love Albuquerque. I think it's the coolest place to visit on the planet. And I don't want to see it um, happen here, what we've seen in other communities, which is a dramatic increase in the number of short-term rentals, which has really impacted the housing stock of some of our, um, our fellow communities across the United States. And I think given our unique, beautiful um, Albuquerque, that is a possibility. And so I wanna just say, you know, this short-term rental agreement that we're putting forward here is really just to address that. It does not impact anyone who is legally operating short-term rentals right now. In fact, it allows a tripling of the size of the short-term rental market in Albuquerque. There are currently 600 permitted units this would allow for up to 1,800 units. Um, now, Ms. Dolan's much nicer than me. She says that there's quite a few that are not permitted and she's using those numbers. I honestly don't really care about those numbers because I wanna talk about the number of people that are actually following the law right now. But I do think it's important that we think about folks that are legally doing this right now. And that's why we included that really important amendment for me tonight to say that if you are already operating these units and you have more than three, you get to keep doing that um, as long as you stay legally permitted. And so that was just a really important thing for me to talk about. And we hear a lot about the economic development and economic impact of these. And, and I agree, they're really good for the local economy. We are not impacting that. We are not shortening the number. We're allowing three times the number of short-term rentals in our community. So, you know, again, I think that there's some work to be done here. I look forward to meeting with other folks and really thinking through some of these additional items that we talked about tonight and finding the right wording on some of this. But I do think this is something that we need to consider for the future of Albuquerque. And um, I know there's a motion in a second. So um, I'll just turn it back over to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Fubelcorn. And there's no other comments. Um, we'll go ahead and vote on final bill as amended. Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, I'd like to confirm this vote is for a due pass. That is correct. And that's correct. No. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Fablecorn? Yes. Councilor Pena? No. Councilor Sanchez? No. That fails on a 2-3 vote. Councilors and everyone, we will now move on to agenda item H, which is O-70, Councilor Davis. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think we have to dispose of that other oh. item first. I think the first motion for a due pass failed, but we do need a new motion. Um, and if I'm correct, I think I'd like to make the motion for a no recommendation so that it can move to full council. Okay. So we are voting on no recommendation to full council. If there's a second. If there's a second. Second. Mr. Chair. Second. Yes, Mr. I want to I want to just jump in because the, the the matter has been disposed of by the vote, and so to the extent there is a secondary motion, we would need to reconsider the bill. That is possible to do under the rules. Um, however, uh, that matter having been voted on um, and disposed of in that matter would require reconsideration in order to consider a different motion. Mr. Chair, may I? Councilor Davis. Mr. Melendez, I apologize. I may have lost track there. I thought the motion was for a do pass and that just failed, but we didn't do a do not pass. So what is the status? Mr. Chair, uh, the rules provide that a motion that uh, is denied based on a motion for due pass is reported out as such at the next council meeting. And then there's the opportunity for the council to reject the committee report. Um, however, a, a do not pass motion is a final motion in committee. 
So if we leave it, it'll just run, it'll be reported out and we can decide if we wanna take that as is that council. Mr. Chair, that's correct. And that that um, that is the four vote uh, needed in order to uh, override a, a vote such as the one that just happened by a committee. Then Mr. Chair, I guess I don't have a standing for a motion and I would defer to the sponsor if she wants to try to reconsider and otherwise we'll see it in a few weeks. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, I, I would certainly move for a reconsideration with a, and a motion for a um, move to full council with no rec if that is some, if the will of the committee um, matches that. Um, Mr. Chair, you one more clarification and, and sorry to be the rule police today, but um, in order for a reconsideration to be offered, it must be offered by somebody that voted on the prevailing side of the outcome. Um, so uh, one of the folks voting no that prevailed in that motion would need to make that motion for reconsideration. Thank you, Mr. Melendres, for clarification. So if there's no motion, then we'll be moving on. Mr. Chair, I'd make the um, motion for reconsideration of the do not pass. Second. Okay, so now, uh, Mr. Melendez, is that correct? We're going to go ahead and vote on the uh, motion. Mr. Chair, that's correct. Okay, so we'll be voting on that on the motion. Um, let's go to the vote. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes, to reconsider. Councilor Fablecoin. Yes, yes, to reconsider. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 5-0 vote. Okay. Now we can now- Mr. Move. Chair, Mr. Oh. Chair, I'd, I'd make a motion for a no rec to full council. Second. Okay, and is there a second? Yes, Councillor Davis. So now we're voting on the motion, no rec to full council. Ready for the vote. Councillor Bassan. No. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fablecorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena. I think she's on the uh, phone. Hello, Council yes. Yes, Councillor Pena? Yes. Okay. Councillor Sanchez? No. And that passes on a 3 2 vote. Okay. Anything else? Any other fun? Okay. If there's, if there's uh, nothing else, then we'll move on to agenda item H, and which is 070, um, Councillor Davis. You're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. After all that, we may need a drink. Uh, 070 amends the Albuquerque Alcoholic Liquor Ordinance. I move it to oh, pass. Yes. Second. Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just very briefly, uh, this matter is basically a cleanup to align our city ordinance with our state. Uh, changes to the state liquor ordinance. Um, it does include a new provision um, uh, that sort of waives the church and school distance requirement that's been in the law for some time. Um, essentially, this is, I'm going to editorialize here and just say uh, most of our uh, churches and schools who have the opportunity to participate in this choose not to, or even if they do object, um, have, well, most of them don't object and we're trying to give them a way uh, to not prohibit uh, good businesses that are otherwise well regulated uh, and operators to participate in our economy. So uh, with happy to take other uh, questions. Any other comments? Seeing none, um, anyone signed up to speak? No, Mr. Chair. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think we have a committee. committee. Mr. Chair, I think we have a committee sub yet. Yeah, Looks like we have a committee sub in our iPads. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll move the committee, sir. Second by Councillor Peeblecorn. And are we going to show the committee sub? Those are quite large, but I can definitely do that. It's a little large, but I think we can put it up there. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Ronquillo may give just a quick overview of what the committee sub does. I think it's largely technical cleanup, so I'm not sure that there's much substance to go through. Okay, Mrs. Ronquillo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as Director Melendra has indicated, most of the um, contents of the committee sub uh, are additional cleanups, um, clarifications, um, and then the biggest piece of it being um, uh, adding clarifying language regarding the distance waiver uh, component that Councillor Davis mentioned. Thank you, Mr. Ronquillo. Anyone else? I just have a question. I've just um, I've known for years and years, for several years, that we've actually had that 300 feet requirement from churches and schools. Um, can you explain that a little bit, Ms. Ronquillo? Sure. So that um, distance requirement actually originates uh, in state law. The, at the state level, the Liquor Control Act prohibits the sale of alcohol within 300 feet of any church or school unless the city grants a waiver of that prohibition. And so the city um, gets to set the circumstances in which it will grant that waiver. Uh, currently, the city requires a waiver when a proposed location is within 300 feet of a church or school, but only when that location is in certain areas of the city and for certain license types. Thank you, Mr. Okio. So what we're saying here is this, this this waiver would actually um, not let the city, it just means that every single time we can actually have um, this waiver takes place every single time that uh, an event comes up or that someone moves 300 feet um, from a church or a school, they can automatically open up without even addressing the waiver issue. Is that, am I understanding that correct? Mr. Chair, so this bill proposes to allow waivers of the school distance requirement for any license type at any location in the city, um, but it would still be subject to some review criteria um, that our liquor hearing officer would have to go through. There are um, 12 elements that go into that, um, and it would be um, considered at the, the hearing on the license. Um, however, for um, licenses that are in proximity to a church, um, the um, waiver would be granted without going through the formal waiver process that I mentioned. Okay. And what about with a school? Um, with the school, it would um, have to go through a waiver process, which is outlined in the bill. There are certain criteria that the liquor hearing officer has to consider um, when reviewing those applications. So it would not be um, automatically granted uh, for schools. Okay. All right. Thank you for answering those questions. Anyone else have any questions? If not, um, let's go ahead and go to a vote on uh, the committee sub. And yeah. we had a second, correct, already? So um, go ahead and go to go call the vote. Sorry. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fablecorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. And Councillor Sanchez. Yes. And that passes on a 5-0 vote. And now we're back on the bill, correct? Um, oh, need a vote on the substitute? I'm confused. Is that right? On the bill as substituted. The bill as substituted. Got it. Okay. So now we're ready to vote on the bill as substituted. Thank you. Are you good to go? Yes. Okay. Going, we're ready to vote. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Fugelcorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Passes on a 5 0 vote. We will now move on to agenda item I 0 71. Councillor Davis? And feeble corn and penya. 
I believe the other sponsors have worked on this more than I have, Mr. President, or Mr. Chair, if, uh, if they'd prefer to present. Um, Mr. Chair, um, I'd actually prefer for one of my other co-sponsors just because my internet's so in and out and I can't even turn on my audio, my video. Okay, that leaves you, Councillor Fuelcorn. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Chair, um, this is 071, amending Chapter 7, Article 2, Section 1 of the Transit Ordinance to establish the permanent zero fare on Albuquerque Rapid Transit and zero fare for Sun Van service through the transit department's qualification process, um, I'll move it to pass. Do we have a second, Councillor Davis? Yep. And Mr. Chair, if I may just say that, you know, this is this is part of the um, uh, very impressive negotiation um, process that happened on a previous transit bill that we did finally pass. We had taken this section out because it would have delayed the passage of that original transit bill. And so this is that section just moved into its own bill. Um, don't believe there was a lot of controversy over this, but uh, I just wanted to make sure that that was clear that that was uh, moved. Thank you, Councillor Feeblecorn, Councillor Davis, or Councillor Pena. You you good? Urge your support. Okay. Okay. There's also a com uh, committee substitute in your iPads. Sure, let's present that. I would move that sub, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Do you have a second, Councillor Feeblecorn? Um, any comments or questions? Um, Councillor Bassan? Mr. Chair, can we be, can it be explained what the difference is? I, I'm seeing the, <clears throat> the underlining on this, but I just want to make sure without comparing them back and forth, if we can have staff clarify the change, because it doesn't look or I'm not finding significance. Thank you. Who would that be? Mr. Chair, I don't know if Mr. Minakuchi is here, but I can quickly just say that the change here is um, that on page three, that starting with line 10, this is the, um, the idea that no one lay obstructing or resisting or opposing um, an individual that works for the city that's basically the bus driver or security, um, they, you know, it would be um, specifically spelled out in here that that's not allowed so that we're trying to protect those folks that are driving the buses and, and uh, serving the security. Mr. Hertz, did you have something to say in reference to this one? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Feeblecorn, I, I think uh, Councillor Feeblecorn outlined it pretty well. Um, I think uh, I know that it was legal staff that um, had uh, comments on this, so I'll, I'll defer to them if they have anything else to add. Anyone else? Okay, no one else, so. Um, uh, Mr. Okay. Chair? Yes. Uh, just to follow up on that, if I may. Um, Go ahead, Council. Sorry, I'm trying to compare the two. I just am wondering, I guess this is the first time I've noticed the plus symbols. So I'm wondering um, what what yeah. they signify in this, but also on page three, line 13, how it it ends in an or, and then it goes into the severability clause. So I'm just wondering if that might be a technical edit or if there's something else that will be added, or if that's what these plus symbols mean. I would like some confirmation of all of that, please. Um, Mr. Hertz, could you help us? Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Councillor Bassan, I think the the plus the plus signs that were included in there, um, it was actually Mr. Menacucci that worked on this, and so I think that was just the way that he was uh, denoting um, uh, how how it was um, added, or there was additional language added to the bill. Um, I don't think there was anything additional that was intended to be added. What was already there. I, I think it was just the way that he denoted it in the bill. Mr. Melendres, do you have something else to add? Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, I just wanted to, to reaffirm uh, Jeff's assessment. You know, we have the benefit of, of Mr. Minicucci with you know decades of experience with council services and, and once upon a time, way back when, that's, that's how all bills were drafted. And so it's a little bit of a carryover in his drafting style, but it just means 
uh, additional materials. Sometimes you'll see a minus in stuff he drafts, which means the deletion of material. It's just an extra signal that we don't use anymore uh, for the most part, but it's not improper in form. Mr. Chair. Yes, Councilor Desan. Thank you so much. And I, that obviously predates me. So thank you for confirming that because it's new for me to see. But so now the last part of my question, it seems as though we just need to delete or on line 13, or is there something else pending that needs to be added after that? Mr. Melendres, can you help on that one? Mr. Chair, it's my understanding that that's, that's just a, a typographical fix that we'll usually do in the enrolling and engrossing process. Um, uh, it's, a, it, it's you know the type of thing that we'd consider a clerk's correction um, that we can get done. Thank you. I just wanted to confirm and make sure I was reading it all right and on the same page. So I appreciate it. Thank you all. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. Melendres. Any other comments? Uh, see none. So we'll move to vote on the committee sub. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Councilor Davis. Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councilor Pena. Yes. Councilor Sanchez. Yes. And that passes on a 5 0 vote. Councilors, if there's no other further questions or comment, uh, need a vote on the final bill as substituted, and we're ready for the vote. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Peeblecorn? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. And that passes on a 5 0 vote. Okay, we will now move on to agenda item J. O-74, Councilor Bassan. Mr. Chair, the abbreviated title to O-74 is authorizing the sale of general obligation bonds not to exceed $34,300,000 consisting of $19,300,000 general purpose obligation bonds and 15 million short-term general obligation bonds to finance projects relating to public safety, citizen centers, parks and recreation, facilities and equipment, library, museum and cultural facilities, storm sewers, streets, public transportation, affordable housing, and metropolitan redevelopment. I move it to pass. Do you second? Second. Second, Councillor Davis. Councillors, any questions about it? Okay, there being no questions, Councillors um, need a vote? Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. And Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Passes on a 5 0 vote. Okay, Mr. let's Chair? see. Yes. Councillor Bassan, sorry about that. Mr. Chair, the administration would like to request immediate action, so I will move that now. Okay, so. We will move on immediate action. Do I have a second? Councillor Fee. Second. And we'll go ahead and move to vote for immediate action. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. And that passes on a 5 0 vote. Okay, we will now move on to agenda item L. And that's R-103, Councillor Pena. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm gonna to try to handle this the best I can. If I um, uh, my internet goes out, if you could please just um, carry it out for me. I'm directing the city of Albuquerque to provide a bilingual pay differential eligible, um, differential eligible to city employees. Um, I would move a due pass. In a second, second. Councillor Fiebelkorn. Councillors, any question or staff or administration? I have a quick comment on this. Um, I actually thought this um, was already uh, happening, uh, but I guess since I'm a city employee, but under APD, we were doing it there. And I just know that we're looking at the uh, administration to put some rules together in reference to this. And one of the things that we did, it might not be a bad idea to explore the way APD was doing it. Um, we had different levels. We had a speaking level and a conversational level, and then we had a reading and writing level. Um, so the conversational level was 
a lower percentage and this percentage it's like five percent so it would be a two percent and then if you were fully bilingual and could translate and also and also read and write then uh, you got the full amount and it pretty much amounted to just basically getting the point across on the conversational side and then on the other side it was um it was actually being able to take a statement being able to, to completely completely without an issue help this person and understand their needs so those were the two things and i just wanted to see if uh, the mayor's conference room what they're thinking in reference um to that idea thank you mr chair and uh, uh councillor peña and councillors uh thank you for your time uh, uh administration ha do have some concerns uh we do have a process right now where we do pay certain employees. I think it, it, we need some clarity uh, as to the intent of, of this bill. And I do have uh, Director uh, Yara here, as well as uh, uh, you know D Director Romero here. And uh, we would like to kind of ask some questions just to clarify what is your intent. And we'll go uh, start with uh, Director Rachel. Good evening, uh, Chairman Sanchez, Councilor Pena. Uh, we do have five uh, categories of employees who currently receive the bilingual pay differ differential. Um, as uh, Chairman Sanchez uh, spoke about, APOA has one that does have those two tiers. We have uh, AFR that also has a pay differential as well as three ask me uh, collective bargaining agreements that address a pay differential. That's with the RJ series security officers, management series and clerical. They're all a little bit different and some of them uh, in the contracts have negotiated a max amount of um, employees that would be eligible to receive it. We're not really near the max on um, any one of those right now, we have about 177 employees that are participating throughout those five categories of employees. And uh, Mr. Chair and Counselors, this is Stephanie Yara. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about um, trying to figure out which employees um, would add value by providing bilingual services. Um, you know, it could be the case that maybe a for example, a principal accountant might be bilingual, but there's no um, direct uh, contact with that employee uh, with the public and wouldn't need to provide such language services. Um, the, other, the other concern I have is that a 5% uh, across the board kind of increase for people who would qualify um, would actually be, would cause inequity for those who are making $50,000 a year compared to those making $100,000. Um, the other thing is we would just need more clarity about how they would be tested uh, as far as their competency in both oral and written language and who would be responsible for providing uh, that testing. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pena, would you like to respond to any of that? Councillor Davis? I certainly don't want to take Councillor Pena's thunder, but um, while she's connecting again, yeah, I, I understand the concern here, I, but I could also, I think that 5% difference, Ms. Yara, does is an important one. And uh, I, maybe perhaps I, um, I would again defer to the sponsor of the administration to work on this a little bit. Um, but I, I'm like Councilor Sanchez, I, I was conversant when I used it often as a police officer. I'm not as much anymore. Um, and it's a useful skill. But I also look to Mexico as the only state that has Spanish as an official language. And so, so says the counselor who represents our international district. We just got through a very long process with a, an, an Asian language primary speaker. Um, involved in the planning department, for example, and they would have loved to have an accountant come down and translate if they happen to be around. Um, and so I kind of, I, Councilor Payne and I passed our, our language access law, I don't know, Councilor Payne, six years ago or so. 
Um, and the administration took years to implement it. Um, and we still don't have it across all of our departments, but I kind of think this is an important thing we ought to do in our city for diversity and for equity. I, I do think some of those decisions, and I'm not sure Ms. Yara meant this in this way, but as a general rule, I think the administration would rather us not prescribe how they determine all those qualifications and leave that to rulemaking or, or policy. But I kind of like this as a big picture thing. And I, I'm hoping maybe the sponsor and the administration could work on some of those details um, at some point. And, uh, but I, I think I kind of count me in favor of this one. Thank you, Councillor Davis. And do we have anyone else in the mayor's conference room? I saw your hand up and then it went down. No, Councillor Bassan. Mr. Chair, um, I don't know if Councillor Pena made it back to to speak to some of this as well, but <clears throat> excuse me. So I, uh, reading this legislation earlier, I was thinking, oh, wow, that sounds really nice. And I think that we should be incentivizing people who speak multiple languages. I, I know that I certainly do not. So when other people do and I need their help, I think that that should be available. While reading the legislation, I also thought, geez, 5% seems like it might be a lot when we're actually, I mean, it, it doesn't seem like it when we're talking about one paycheck, but to what the administration just brought up and to their point, I think that it could be a significant amount of funding that I, th I think it is a valid point to say, just because you speak two or more languages, I don't know if that should entitle people to make more money if it's not applicable to their job description. And so I would hope that this can be worked on a little bit more and fine tuned to where maybe there's an incentive available or <clears throat> something that the administration and, and we can offer to people that speak more than one language. Um, but but I am hesitant to vote in favor of this while thinking about the financial big picture on a lump hole. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. That's that's the thing that was worrying me Ms. as well. Um, I think Councilor Pena is ready to speak, right? Go ahead, yes, um, yes. Um, before my internet goes down again, I actually just wanted to say that that's um, why it was it intentionally left um, open just so that the administration could have the discretion to administer it. And obviously, when you're talking about incentivizing pay, it's not really just because you speak Spanish. You know, I just want to really be clear about that or because you because you um, speak um, um another language. It's really about um, people who are also um, being asked during the course of their job to speak to to people in Spanish. So this is why um, I, I left it open because I think that HR or the departments could really um, figure out a way to administer that, right? So if you're both at the same place and somebody who is very fluent can speak Spanish and they actually need to um, provide some type of customer service or talk to, um, talk to the public, then that discretion is going to have to be left up to who is the most qualified um, to be able to do that at, um, at any at any given um, job. So if everybody in the office is required to um, speak a foreign language, well then absolutely it should be, um, um, should be um, preferred. But it's also, it's just for people who, I, you, uh, it's happened at council before, somebody comes into the office and everybody's looking um, to try to hunt down somebody who can speak Spanish. Um, to um, communicate with someone. So if you're asking somebody to do that, to, to be that, it's actually asking them to perform another another duty, right? Um, so anyway, that was the intention for, for leaving it open-ended so that um, it would give the administration the flexibility to be able to ad administer properly. Because saying that we shouldn't do it is to me, I mean, it, it goes against, um, I think what Councillor um, Davis was saying earlier, it goes against what we were trying to, to we passed um, years ago, right? So um, this wouldn't be just because I, um, or if I was in a, if, if I worked for the city of Albuquerque, I was in a job that I didn't need to communicate in a different language in order to, um, to fulfill my job, well, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't get the differential pay. But if it, I were to, then I would. And it could be tiered. It could be across the board 5%. It could be whatever whatever the administration deems. 
Thank you, Councilor Pena, and me having experience with this firsthand, being an officer on the street, as well as Councilor Davis, we, you know, when you run across someone who speaks Spanish, one of the things that I had is I had the 2%, the 2.5%, um, and if and it's because I chose to take the test on conversational. I didn't take the test for reading and writing, and um, if I would have done that, then I would have been at the full 5%. So, um, the conversational portion was very, very, very easy to pass, and it was basically based on just making sure that you got the point across and both both parties understood what was going on. When you went into the reading and writing and translating, that could be very detrimental because you could get into lawsuit situations or or actually working on a criminal case. You need to know exactly that translation. So I hope somewhere along the line that the administration does work on some sort of uh, tiered approach to make sure that uh, that we do have uh, the right people uh, making the communications with the public. And, and that goes for every language. Um, Councilor Davis. Uh, thanks, Mr. Chair. And, and I might add, um, if this legislation moves forward, I would love to see us try to figure out um, or at least include sign language as a, a qualified language. Sometimes that gets left out of the conversation, but it's incredibly important. Uh, for our ASL community. Um, I think it's in our language access law, but uh, but perhaps in uh, in a drafting or a next round, uh, if there are amendments, uh, we could correlate those two laws and definitions to be sure they're, that uh, the services we're providing or incentivizing match up with those that uh, Office of Equity and Inclusion and others determine were important. Uh, but, uh, but again, I like this. I think, uh, I hope it moves forward and maybe some technical cleanup can happen before full council. Thank you. I'm hoping for that same technical cleanup. Um, if there's no other questions or comments, um, we can move to the vote. Can I close? Um, oh, Mr. I'm Chair? sorry. Yes, I'm sorry, Council. Go ahead. Um, thanks for your comments, um, <laughs> Councillor Davis. That is the intent. So if it's not clear in this legislation, I would I would propose to um, put that in for the next meeting if this um, if this does um, go forward with the with the due pass and. I think Councillor Pena. I think out. I lost you. Anyway, I would um, urge your support. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pena. And with that, we'll move to a vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a five-zero vote. We will now move on to agenda item M. That's R-107. Councillor Davis Feeblecorn for Benton by request. Mr. Chair, since our my colleague did the transit one over this one. Uh, this is uh, relating to the Metropolitan Redevelopment Leasing and Sale of Metropolitan Redevelopment Project uh, within the downtown Metropolitan Redevelopment area and all of those things. Uh, Mr. Chair, this is that downtowner project that uh, we've heard so much about downtown. Uh, and it proposes to approve an application for redevelopment. I move it to pass. Second. Second by Councillor Feeblecorn. Councillors, um, any comments for the staff or the administration? Seeing none, um, let's go for the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Pena. Yes. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. That passes on a 5-0 vote. Thank you. And also I have a note here that says um, that this is scheduled to move for immediate action. And I need a second. So moved, Mr. Chair. Um, Councillor Davis. So moved. Any questions or comments? If not, let's move. Um, to immediate action, and the vote must be unanimous. Councillor Passan? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Feeblecorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Yes. Councillor Sanchez? Yes. And that passes 5-0. We will now move on to agenda item N. That's R-109. And Councillor Bassan for Benton by request. Councillor Bassan. 
Mr. Chair, R109 is approving and authorizing the acceptance of grant funds from the New Mexico Economic Development Department and providing an appropriation to the Parks and Recreation Department. I move it to pass. Second. Second by Councilor Fubelkorn. And any questions or comments? Seeing none, um, Councilors, we'll move to a vote. Councilor Gasson. Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. And that passes on a 5 0 vote. I also, show, I also show this one also is slated for immediate action, and I need a second. Mr. Chair, I'd like to move for immediate action. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. Um, is second. And again, the vote must be unanimous. Ready for the vote. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Davis? Yes. Councilor Bibacourt? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Councilor Sanchez? Yes. That passes 5-0. We will now move on to agenda item. Oh, and that's R-114, Councilor Bassan by request. Mr. Chair, R114 is authorizing the giving of notices for bids for the sale of the $19,300,000 City of Albuquerque, New Mexico General Obligation General Purpose Bonds, Series 2023A. I move a due pass. Second. Second by Councillor Fiebelkorn. And Councillors, any discussion? Seeing none, we're ready for the vote. Councillor Bassan? Yes. Councillor Davis? Yes. Councillor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councillor Pena? Councillor Sanchez? Yes. Councillor Pena? And that passes on a 4 0 vote. Mr. Chair? Yes, Councillor Bassan. I would like to move for immediate action. Okay. And the vote again is for immediate action. Do I have a second? Second. Councillor Fiebelkorn. And we're voting for immediate action. Councillor okay, Ready for the vote. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Davis. Yes. Councillor Fiebelkorn. Yes. Councillor Pena. Councillor Sanchez. Yes. Councillor Pena. And that passes on a 4 0 vote. Thanks, everyone. There be no further, there being no further business, this FGO committee meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Nice job, Mr.